Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Sabatine from the Timmy Study Group at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Welcome to this educational activity on LDL cholesterol lowering with PCSK9 inhibitors. The following audio is from a two-part video presentation with Dr. Mark S. Sabatine. The audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Optimizing LDLC Lowering with PCSK9 Inhibition, Exploring New Advances in Treatment Delivery and Cardiovascular Outcomes. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash YHT. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. So how was PCSK9 discovered? It really was a fascinating story rooted in genetics. And now, a little bit over a decade ago, a family was found in France that had the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia. So they had very high cholesterol levels. They had early onset of cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction and stroke. And so investigators looked for the typical loci that might explain this genetic disorder in the LDL receptor and in ApoB, and they didn't find any mutations there. They did then, in further investigation, find mutations in this gene, PCSK9. However, at that point, no one really knew exactly how PCSK9 was related to lipid metabolism. In a series of very elegant basic science studies, that work was then sorted out. Basically, PCSK9 plays a role in cholesterol metabolism by, if you will, chaperoning the LDL receptor to its destruction inside a cell. So imagine, if you will, a hepatocyte, and in the circulation, there's circulating uh, LDL particles. It will bind to the LDL receptor and then be internalized. Well, at that point, there's one of two fates for that LDL receptor. Either it can recycle to the surface of the hepatocyte and take more LDL out of the circulation, or it could be targeted for destruction in the lysosome in the cell. And it turns out PCSK9 facilitates that targeting. So it turns out that for the family that was found that had the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia, or high levels of cholesterol, they had gain of function mutations in PCSK9. And so that means they had fewer hepatic LDL receptors available on the surface to take cholesterol out of the circulation. And so they had more circulating LDL cholesterol and thus the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia. Well, now you can imagine if that's the case for a gain of function mutation, what would happen in the reverse? What would happen if someone had a loss of function mutation? Well, in that case, it'd be the exact opposite. You would assume then that they would have uh, more LDL receptors that'd be free to recycle to the surface of the liver. Those receptors could clear more LDL out of the circulation, and those patients should be protected from cardiovascular disease. So that was the hypothesis. It turns out that hypothesis was correct. And so additional patients were found not with gain of function, but with loss of function mutations in the same gene in PCSK9. Those individuals had lower levels of LDL cholesterol, and they had strikingly lower risk of cardiovascular disease. It was seen in one study led by uh, Jonathan Cohen and Helen Hobbs at UT Southwestern, and then replicated in multiple other cohorts with a very consistent genetic effect. And so that for us, I think, is very reassuring as clinicians and as scientists to see that individuals who have lower levels of LDL cholesterol mediated uh, by uh, PCSK9 would then have lower risk of a cardiovascular disease, and particularly myocardial infarction. So then, with that data in hand, then it suggested that PCSK9 could be a very uh, intriguing target for pharmacologic therapy. And thus, several companies have now developed drugs to inhibit PCSK9. Probably the most advanced technology currently, the one that's farthest along, are the monoclonal antibodies to PCSK9 inhibiting its function. 
And the notion is that these monoclonal antibodies would basically recapitulate what we saw in the genetics, that the antibodies would bind to PCSK9, which as it turns out, is secreted by the hepatocyte and then binds to the LDL receptor. And that complex is then internalized into the cell. So thankfully, because the binding happens on the outside of the hepatocyte, that creates an opportunity to have an antibody against PCSK9 and prevent it from binding to the LDL receptor. By preventing that interaction, then when the LDL receptor becomes internalized into the hepatocyte, uh, the LDL will be processed inside the cell, but the LDL receptor can then be recycled to the surface and take more LDL cholesterol out of the circulation. So armed with that information, then what are the data uh, around these monoclonal antibodies, evolocumab and alirocumab? Um, by and large, the pharmacologic properties are pretty similar. And they've been studied in a broad array of different patient populations. Um, certainly, probably the one of greatest interest is the, if you will, run-of-the-mill patient with hypercholesterolemia already treated with a statin. Uh, and in these patients, uh, evolocumab, for example, can reduce LDL cholesterol, and this is on top of a statin, by about 60 to 75 percent or so. And we had done a series of dose-ranging studies, Laplace TIMI 57 was one of them, that showed these results. This was confirmed in, in phase three studies as well. Um, then another population of interest is patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. Typically, these are patients who do have a mutation in the LDL receptor, and so they're very hard to get their LDL cholesterols down, even with statin therapy. Um, but in these patients who are heterozygotes for familial hypercholesterolemia, so they have one working gene and one defective gene, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors are still quite efficacious, again, lowering LDL cholesterol by about 60% or so. And then the last clinical population of interest are patients who are statin intolerant, typically due to muscle side effects. Um, and those patients wind up being at very high risk because they can't get the foundation of our lipid-lowering therapy, and so they typically have very high LDL cholesterol levels. And it turns out the PCSK9 inhibitors are very well tolerated in this population, and again, very effective, reducing LDL cholesterol, uh, again, by about 60 to 75 percent or so, depending on the study. Um, those are numbers for evolocumab. Alirocumab, in general, gives very similar results. The dosing can be a little bit different in some of the trials. For example, for alirocumab, in some of the studies, patients started uh, with a half dose and then were titrated up based on their LDL cholesterol. So in the studies themselves, the reduction in LDL cholesterol is a bit less pronounced, more in the 50% or so range. But again, that's a function of how the drug uh, was given. At, at full doses, the two drugs are, are indeed quite, quite comparable. And then recently, we've had some additional genetic data that are uh, very reassuring. This is work um, that I participated in, that Brian Ferentz uh, led, um, looking at Mendelian randomization. And so um, what we looked at in this study were uh, variants that affected LDL cholesterol in, in two genes. One was in HMG-CoA reductase, as you'll recall. That's the target for statins. Um, and in over 100,000 patients from over 14 studies who had over 14,000 major cardiovascular events, we saw that for individuals who had a greater burden of variance in the HMG-CoA reductase gene that led to lower levels of LDL cholesterol, those individuals had a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And that's exactly what, what we would uh, expect. It's like being on increasing doses of a statin, if you will. And that had been seen and noted before. Um, what we also then did was do the same experiment for the PCSK9 gene. And in that case, again, we saw a very clear relationship. Uh, the greater the burden of variance that uh, led to lower LDL cholesterol in the PCSK9 gene, the lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the kicker then for this analysis was we were able to compare then the effects of LDL lowering mediated through variants in the HMG-CoA reductase gene, so that's equivalent to getting a statin, if you will, 
and variants in the PCSK9 gene, and that's going to be equivalent to getting a PCSK9 inhibitor. And when you normalize it and look at the effect per millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, the clinical benefit was exactly the same. So the, an LDL reduction of about 10 milligrams per deciliter mediated through either gene was associated with a 19% reduction in the odds of having a, a cardiovascular death or an MI. So these data are very exciting uh, and very uh, reassuring that when we do ultimately see the results from the clinical trials, we expect the benefit to be absolutely on par per millimole reduction as to what's been seen with statins. So um, stay tuned. In the next presentation, I'll actually review the efficacy and safety findings from uh, Osler and uh, the Odyssey trials for some of the exploratory cardiovascular endpoints that have been uh, examined to date. And then I'll introduce you to a patient with poorly controlled hypercholesterolemia and examine the impact of updated guidelines and some of these new advances in therapy. And let me begin and, and orient you a little bit to the Osler program. So typically for lipid lowering therapy, there'll be a series of trials that are done, phase two dose ranging trials, phase three confirmation trials, where the endpoint is LDL uh, cholesterol reduction. And typically these trials are of about three months uh, in duration or so. And they typically are several hundred patients in each trial. And so not enough patients, not enough events cardiovascular events to comment on cardiovascular risk. Um, but what happened in the evolocumab uh, development program was all these patients were invited to participate in an extension program where once they completed one of the parent trials, they would be re-randomized to either receive the PCSK9 inhibitor evolocumab or standard of care uh, alone. And all told, we had close to 4,500 patients who agreed to participate uh, in the long-term follow-up. Uh, and we followed them uh, for about a year in this randomized comparison. So now we have a substantial number of patients followed for a more substantial uh, amount uh, of time. First, in terms of reduction of LDL cholesterol, as we had expected, there was a robust reduction, uh, a 61% reduction in LDL cholesterol from about 120 milligrams per deciliter uh, down to about 45 or 50 milligrams per deciliter. In absolute terms, this was a 73 milligram per deciliter drop in LDL cholesterol, uh, one of the largest for any uh, general randomized control trials. Moreover, uh, the benefit was sustained through one year of therapy. And now in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, we looked at a composite of death, uh, myocardial infarction, unstable angina, requiring hospitalization, coronary revascularization, stroke, transient ischemic attacks, or heart failure leading to hospitalization. Uh, and there was a striking 50% reduction uh, in the incidence of this uh, composite cardiovascular outcome. Interestingly, the curve started diverging early within three months or so and then continued to separate out over time. So a small number of events, only about 50 or 60 events, uh, not the primary goal of this uh, extension study, which was to look at, at safety uh, and long-term LDL lowering, but nonetheless, very reassuring uh, data. In terms of safety, evolocumab appeared to be quite safe. The incidence of any adverse event and serious adverse events were the same in the evolocumab and the standard of care alone arms. The proportion of patients who needed to discontinue evolocumab due to an adverse event was quite low, just about 2.5%. Injection site reactions were uncommon, only about 4%. Muscle-related adverse events were similar between the two arms. There was a numeric imbalance in balance and neurocognitive cognitive events. However, this wasn't a, a pre-specified outcome and was unexpected and will require further study, which, which is ongoing. Laboratory data also looked very reassuring. No differences in levels of aminotransferases, no difference in, in creatine kinase levels. We also simply looked at the incidence of adverse events in patients stratified by how low their LDL cholesterol got. 
Remember, the PCSK9 inhibitors are very powerful uh, uh, agents to lower LDL cholesterol. Uh, and so in the study, we had a goodly number of patients who actually had an LDL cholesterol below 25 milligrams per deciliter. And when we looked at the rates of all the events I mentioned before and compared that to individuals who were in the standard of care alone arm, whose LDL cholesterol was on average about 120 milligrams per deciliter, so about five times higher, there was no difference in any side effects, adverse events, serious adverse events, muscle-related, neurocognitive, all the same. So again, those are reassuring data that we don't see any dose response of any safety signal as LDL cholesterol uh, gets uh, down to low levels. Similar data exist for alirocumab in their Odyssey um, program, where they've looked over the course of uh, a year plus in patients in one of their longer-term follow-up studies. Again, alirocumab significantly reduced LDL cholesterol in that study from about 120 down to about 50 or so, so very similar to what we saw with evolocumab uh, in the Osler program. And again, really recapitulating similar results, again, having the rate of a composite of cardiovascular outcomes very similar to the ones I mentioned before. So all told now, we have, uh, albeit in an exploratory hypothesis of both of these studies, uh, now with about 100 events total between the two trials, uh, very nice data showing lower rates of cardiovascular outcomes with the addition of a PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, We've taken these data, uh, and um, Mike Silverman, our group, has led this analysis, which recently came out in, in JAMA, meta-regression, basically looking at what is the benefit in terms of reduction of, of uh, risk of vascular events across nine different classes of lipid-lowering therapies. We're all familiar with the data for statins, a large body of evidence where we know that for roughly each millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, there's about a 22, 23% reduction in cardiovascular events. Well, what about for other classes of drugs? We looked at nine different uh, interventions, all told, in over 300,000 um, patients in, in uh, 49 trials. And it turns out, as you look at these different interventions, whether it's intensive diet therapy, bile acid sequestrants, with zetamide, ileal bypass, they all line up beautifully on a regression line, uh, all of which show a consistent result that for each millimole of LDL cholesterol reduction, you get about a 23% reduction in vascular events. The only uh, drug class that fell off the line were actually the CTP inhibitors, but all the other classes line up quite beautifully, and PCSK9 inhibitors, albeit with a small number of events, uh, fit in very nicely with this regression line. So then that sort of begs the question, now that we have a therapy that's now available, um, both evolocumab and alirocumab have been approved by the FDA. Um, we have data that they lower LDL cholesterol to a tremendous amount. Um, we have preliminary data that they appear to reduce cardiovascular events. Now the question is, when should we use them? And that begs the question, how low should we get LDL cholesterol levels? And so it turns out if you look across different populations, particularly hunter-gatherer populations not exposed to a sort of westernized diet, uh, their cholesterol levels are very low, and their LDL cholesterols are estimated to be far lower than what we see in the United States, typically in the sort of 50 milligram per deciliter range or so. We also have other data to suggest lowering LDL cholesterol uh, down uh, below even 70 milligrams per deciliter, perhaps that 40 or 50 milligram per deciliter range would be beneficial. If you look at subgroups from all the statin trials, even for patients coming in whose starting LDL cholesterol uh, was less than 77 milligrams per deciliter, they had exactly the same benefit per millimole reduction of cholesterol as other patients who started with higher levels, suggesting we should certainly get LDL cholesterol down well below 77 milligrams per deciliter. And even in the Jupiter trial, a primary prevention trial, patients coming in with an LDL cholesterol less than 60 milligrams per deciliter, who were then reduced to less than 30 with the addition of a statin, had exactly uh, the same benefit as those who started with higher LDL cholesterols, again suggesting that lower is better even down in that low range.
And so as part of the analysis I mentioned that we did earlier this year that was published in, in JAMA, we did a regression looking now at achieved LDL cholesterol in these different trials and what the event rate was. Obviously, many things affect what the event rate is in a trial, but in these trials, achieved LDL cholesterol was a powerful predictor of outcomes. And in regression lines, it looks like that these lines would uh, intersect the um, the axis and have a very low event rate once you got LDL cholesterol, probably down to about 40 milligrams per deciliter or so. So that's a, a new target for us to start thinking about. What do the guidelines say? Well, fortunately, both the uh, ACC and the counterparts in Europe have recently released guidelines that have addressed uh, how to start to integrate PCSK9 inhibitors uh, into clinical practice. Uh, and they, at least in the U.S. guidelines, call for consideration of PCSK9 inhibitors if the LDL cholesterol level in patients with known atherosclerotic disease is greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per deciliter, and for those with so-called severe atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, meaning a, a recent acute coronary syndrome or, or disease plus diabetes or history of multiple MIs, uh, then they call for considering adding a PCSK9 inhibitor if the LDL cholesterol remains above 70 despite being treated with a statin and maybe a zetamibe as well. And I think as we get additional data, uh, these, these guidelines, these targets will drop even further. So we have dedicated cardiovascular outcomes trials underway uh, globally uh, for the two FDA-approved PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, there are over 27,000 patients in the Fourier trial with evolocumab, uh, and the Odyssey uh, outcomes trial with alirocumab uh, is targeting just under 20,000 patients. Uh, it was just announced that the Fourier trial with evolocumab met both its primary and key secondary endpoints. And then, of course, we'll also await the results of the alirocumab uh, outcomes trial, which uh, we expect to get in the next year or so. Together, these trials should give us the definitive answer for the cardiovascular benefit and the safety for these drugs on top of statin therapy for patients with atherosclerotic disease. Um, so let me end, as I promised, with a discussion of a patient scenario. Um, and so this hypothetical patient's a 63-year-old white male who presents for follow-up. His medical history is notable for a myocardial infarction about three years ago. At that time, he underwent a single-vessel PCI. Recently, he needed a repeat PCI for worsening uh, angina about a year or so ago. He does have a history of diabetes and has hypertension. Um, on exam, his blood pressure still remains a little bit high with a systolic blood pressure of around 155. Uh, and despite uh, being on intensive statin therapy, which I'll get to in a minute, his LDL cholesterol remains what I would consider to be poorly controlled with an LDL cholesterol of 92. He is taking a torvastatin, 80 milligrams daily. Uh, he's also taking a zetamibe, 10 milligrams daily. And in addition, he's on aspirin and an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker and, and uh, medications for his diabetes. Um, and so, you know, this is someone who I would consider is a perfect candidate for a PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, in fact, he would fit into the criteria for the Fourier trial. And per the guidelines, he's an individual who has known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and even really has severe disease. He's had uh, an MI, he's needed repeat PCI, he has diabetes, and despite being on high-intensity statin and an azetamibe, his LDL cholesterol is too high. It's in the 90s. With a PCSK9 inhibitor, we could probably drop it down to the 50s or so, and that would get the LDL cholesterol down into the 40s. We have some other data that's also recently come out that's tantalizing. The Glagoff trial looked at uh, evolocumab. This was a cardiovascular imaging trial. Um, and enrolled patients whose average LDL was 90. Uh, it showed regression of plaque uh, with the addition of evolocumab, and the regression in plaque was proportional to how low the LDL cholesterol was, and that held true going down into the 30s or so. So this is a patient here who I would definitely add a PCSK9 inhibitor, get their cholesterol down, I think that should reduce cardiovascular events based on the genetics, uh, based on the preliminary data we have from clinical studies, and based on the imaging data we have um, from Glagoff. I think as clinicians, of course, we always need to think about any potential barriers for our patients getting the optimal therapy. Um, 
These drugs need to be given through subcutaneous injection. Luckily, um, they are provided as uh, easy to use pen-like auto-injectors but that does require uh, some teaching for the patient. That'll be important to do for, for compliance. And then of course, getting payer approval through the Byzantine healthcare system uh, that we have. Uh, and that requires diligence and careful documentation, but I think it's worth it for our patients to give them the best shot for reducing their risk of cardiovascular outcomes. So let me conclude with a few take home points. I think we know that LDL is a major driver of atherosclerosis. Clinical evidence suggests that optimal LDL cholesterol levels for patients with coronary disease are likely to be much lower than commonly achieved. Um, new guidelines certainly support the use of PCSK9 inhibitors in specific patient populations, those with known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The more aggressive the disease, the more we want to lower the LDL cholesterol and bring a PCSK9 inhibitor on board. Patients with uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, they're very hard to control and have very high risk because of the lifelong high LDL cholesterol. Um, luckily, we have large event-driven outcomes trials that will determine and help clarify the exact benefit for these drugs, and we look forward um, to, to their results. So, I hope you've enjoyed these presentations and that you've learned uh, about the clinical role of PCSK9 inhibition and hypercholesterolemia management. Thank you very much for joining me. This activity has been jointly provided by the University of Florida College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash YHT. This activity is supported by an educational donation provided by Amgen.